Tuesday night in East Lansing. My name is Jim Comperoni, publisher of SpartanMag.com. Welcome in. Gather around. Happy holidays to everybody out there, Michigan State fans, basketball fans, football fans. As we do every week, we talk Michigan State sports here at Spartan Mag Live, and we'll be talking mainly football based on the questions we received over at the Underground Bunker message board. Got about 11 or 12 questions this week. Also, check out the post-game uh, the post game Spartan Mag Live that we did on Saturday night, talking about Michigan State's loss to uh, Ohio State. What was the score? 52-12, to 12, something like that. Also, Michigan State's uh, basketball game. Struggled a little bit with Western Michigan on Sunday evening, getting ready to play the Virginia Cavaliers in the Big Ten ACC Challenge Wednesday night. That's tomorrow night as we record this. By the time you see this, we may have already... Uh, uh, the game may have already been played, but want to get everybody to gather around. Come on in. Let us know what beverages, beverage you're partaking in. Even though it's a Tuesday night, feel free to hit the refreshments and have a good time here every week at the Spartan Mag Live Fun Fest is what it is. It's a fun fest. Anyway, let's go straight to the mailbag. My name is Jim Comproni. Give us a thumbs up if you like the show. Give us a thumbs down if you don't like the show. We're okay either way. Marlo from Graham Blake leading off today. Posted over the Underground Bunker message board. Underground Bunker message board is the daily narrative on Michigan State sports. It is the church of what's happening now with Michigan State football, basketball, and recruiting. Although basketball, that conversation at SpartanMag.com takes place mainly at the final forum message board. I have a lot of fun over there talking Michigan State basketball. If you're not familiar with SpartanMag.com, it's the Michigan State website covering Michigan State, it's the Michigan State website, part of the Rivals.com family, the Rivals.com network, been part of Rivals.com for a long time, Spartan Magazine's been around since, and SpartanMag.com's been around since the beginning of the internet, not quite as long as Lynn Shadnoy was, we, we didn't cover Lynn Shadnoy, but we were around, we've been around for a long time. Spartan Magazine's been around since 19, I was, I've been with them since 1993, prior to that, covered Michigan State in different Places, but you don't want to hear about that. You want to hear, talk, hear about the Spartans a little bit. Marlo from Grand Blank, one of our better subscribers and posters over at SpartanMag.com, says, what do you think Michigan State's percentage of installs are in our offense and defense? Are we limited from knowledge or are we limited from player abilities? So he's wondering how much of the system has been installed, and he's trying to get a handle on what the heck's going wrong with Michigan State. And what's going on with with uh, all the blowouts? Three blowout losses and a loss to Rutgers. I'll tell you what, Mel Tucker's pretty aggravated by those losses as well and the, and the margin of defeat. So I think it's a combination of those things. I think it's athletes and getting familiar with the system and with one another. And in the Big Ten, you know, if you're weak in one little area, it will get exploited, and people will find those areas to exploit. You can have a pretty good team at eight positions on offense and defense, and that's not enough. That's enough to get beat. That's kind of where Michigan State is right now, although Michigan State was good enough to beat Northwestern. But I think it's mostly player abilities. For, for example... A lot of people wanted to see Michigan State spy a little more with Justin Fields, the fine quarterback of the Ohio State Buckeyes, and going through the first quarter, first quarter and looking at things closely. I saw at least one or two plays when Michigan State did have a spy on Fields. One time it was Noah Harvey, and he just kind of sank too far into the defensive backfield, came up trying to make a play, and was a little gave him too much space. I know it's hard to tackle Justin Fields in space, but if you had somebody that was maybe further along in the system that had played a spy in this system before. Maybe he doesn't sink as far. If it's a better athlete, maybe he can make a tackle. Noah Harvey's 6'4", 240. He's a big guy. He was recruited to play the previous system. So he's doing the best he can. Doing pretty solidly between the tackles in some situations. Maybe not the all-encompassing versatile player you want to do a lot of the things that are being asked to do by Michigan State's two linebackers in a two-linebacker system. With two linebackers and a 4-2-5, I'm not exactly clear on whether those linebackers need to be 
more physical or be able to cover more greenery out there? I suspect ideally both, but um, covering all that space, you know, Noah Harvey does some decent things in a 4-3. I think he could be functional. Not perfect for his skill set, but Michigan State, they have what they have. So that's that's one example. You know, um, on defense, you look at the, the touchdown Ohio State scored. Their second touchdown to go up 14-0. It was like a 25-yard touchdown pass to Wilson, number five, the wide receiver. Michigan State dropped into a cover three. Kalen, Kalen Gervin was over there on the near sideline, as you're watching on television, the near sideline. Uh, nearest, the if you're watching, you know, the, the near nearest to the press box and the television broadcast cameras, he's over on this side. They throw to that sideline, and the receiver just has too much space to work with. And Gervin's playing a basic cover three, and everybody, you know, DBs at that level, they know what a cover three is. Arlovsky, the color commentator, made a big deal about the the expression of the route being a wheel route, which became an outcut, and he thought it was a great route combination, something he had never seen before, didn't have a word for it. That's all well and good. Maybe that confused um, Gervin a little bit, because basically Gervin was influenced too far to the inside toward the middle of the field. And Michigan State had a safety in that deep middle. And as the ball was thrown, I suspect that Tucker and, Mar- and Har- Harlan Barnett will not be happy with the spacing of those corners, the back three and the cover three, Kalen Gervin being on the play side of that. Now, Gervin is, what, third year? He's been learning cover three since he's been here. Maybe that's the first time he saw that route. Um, but... If you're in the system longer and you've seen things and you know how to operate with your middle-of-the-field safety, the longer you're in the system, the better handle you're going to have on your spacing back there. Plays like that. You know, I'm sure, you know, in terms of familiarity with the schemes, I'm sure offensive coordinator Jay Johnson, you know, Jay Johnson's a big proponent of using the tight end position. In Michigan State right now with Matt Dotson out, Trenton Gillison out, You have former walk-on Tyler Hunt, who's doing a good job, but Tyler Hunt is being asked to play like 90% of the snaps at tight end. He's still new to the position, and he caught some passes over the middle, and he's not a bad blocker. He's a willing player. Tucker likes him in terms of his will at that position. But if Michigan State had better, uh, you know, three or four, a a deeper cast of tight ends and, you know, a Friar Muth type of guy, of course, then I think more of Michigan State's system would capitalize on those type of players. You asked how much has been installed. Well, they may not be looking to install as much to feature the tight end because they don't have a plethora of tight ends. And, you know, other things that are that are installed, like, uh, you know, you're seeing some cat sweeps more where the center is pulling and getting out and sweeping. Nick Samak, he's more mobile than Matt Allen is. You know, they tried to pull Matt Allen a little bit in the Rutgers game, didn't go so well, didn't go out on the edge to find his landmarks. And I'm not sure Allen was completely had all of his wheels that day. He's not been on the field since. But Samak is more mobile. And you're seeing more of those cat sweeps. And there was one on the first or second possession where they ran it, I think the second possession. And the left guard is J.D. Duplain. So the center, Samak, snaps and pulls out of the left, and Duplain is going to block back here to take that defensive tackle that Samak had vac- vacated. Well, that defensive tackle is that number uh, 92 or 72, Togei. Excellent defensive tackle for, for Ohio State. Excellent defensive tackle. I probably should have made a bigger deal about him when I wrote the pre-snap read. I mean, first snap of the game against Michigan State, I realize Michigan State botched up the play with Rocky Lombardi, pistol formation, going to his right for a handoff, and Connor Hayward went to the left. And Lombardi's like, where'd my guy go? Busted play, tries to get forward, loses a yard. But on that play, Togei took on Samak and Duplain's double team and defeated that double team pretty handily. You know, Duplain climbed off to try to get to the linebacker level. And Samak, who's playing good football on that play, Togei really set a tone and was was a man on that play. And Ohio State came out in the first snap on offense, first first snap on defense. Their linemen really fired on on play number one. Every team tries to do that, 
But Ohio State, even down three offensive linemen starters, really fired strongly on the first play. And the entire offensive line got two yards of movement against the Michigan State defensive line. And the rest of the day, I thought Michigan State's defensive line, for the most part, didn't give much ground. But that first play, they did. Similarly, first play, Michigan State was on offense. Same act and do playing got beat by Togei. Later, I don't know if it was later that drive or the second drive, but Michigan State with that center pull, J.D. Duplain blocking back against Togei. Togei beat him, moved him aside, and was able to go and pursue the play. I'm not sure that he had a hand in upsetting the play, but I'm talking about something that is part of the Michigan State system. They've got Samak, center pull, something they've been doing the last couple of weeks. Still somewhat new. I mean, it's in, it's installed, but how much clockwork, you know, how much does it operate like clockwork, you're asking? Not so great. Duplain, true sophomore. When he's a senior, I suspect when he blocks back on that play, he and Samak will be a lot more proficient at that. More of their man strength will be part of it, provided everybody stays healthy. So on one hand, some things might be installed, but might have the might not have the athletic ability to do all the things, might not have all the tight ends to do some of the tight end things. And in this case, a play that I think will be a staple going forward, not something they're going to run 20 times a game, but once or twice a game. As they, as they do it, as they get more familiar with it, they'll be better at it. So um, how much is installed? I don't know what the percentage would be. You know, I remember Joe Tiller years ago when he first became the coach at Purdue saying that they didn't expect to have 75% of their offense in, in year number one. I don't know if some of that was just rhetoric to try to get people a, a little more patience for the program. I'm not sure, but I've heard that said before, and I, I just think that Michigan State does, could not possibly have everything they have in that they want to do in terms of what they expect to have personnel-wise for the future. I just outlined some examples there, but uh, gets a little it's 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 a little bit vague. Some of those things. All right. Question number two. Spefton from East Lansing says, talking about basketball now. He says, when we play teams like Illinois, will we need Maddie Sissoko in there to slow down their bigs? Can he help us yet, or is he too raw? Um, you know, Izzo was talking in the post game press conference after the Western Michigan game, saying that Sissoko is a guy that they will need against some opponents, and. That's the way they used Edong Ebok later in his career. He, he matched up against some opponents, not so much against others. I think Sissoko is well ahead of where Ebok was as a freshman. So I think Sissoko played three minutes against Western Michigan. I thought he looked good, man. I think he runs well. He's got all that length and strength. And they went... That's, this is what I, I enjoy about covering a Tom Izzo team. Michigan State's up by 14-15. They put in the bench players. It, you know, The score might not have been comfortable enough to put those guys in, but he wanted to take a look at some of those guys, get them some experience also. He wants to take a look at them, A, and B, he wants them to get experience if and when they have to go, um, they have problems with COVID, and they have to bring, you know, they're anticipating what happens if we lose five guys and we've, we have to start some bench players. They want to be prepared for that. So... Um, with Sissoko, he got in the game and they ran a play for him, posted him up, high-low entry feed, and he made a real nice turnaround jumper. So, I mean, you're up by 14. There's a minute and a half left. Some people might tune out and think it's garbage time. Not Tom Izzo. It's not garbage time. It's still, you know, installation, evaluation, experience time. No such thing as garbage time. Getting those guys minutes, getting Matty Sissoko a, t a touchdown low. Also had a touchdown low on, I think, a screen roll high feed from Hogard. Caught it. A little reverse layup going on the other side of the rim to finish, I think. So I'm seeing some some ball skills, some finishing ability with Sissoko. And everybody knows a couple of blocked shots that he had in the Eastern Michigan game were pretty, pretty impressive. Played three minutes. An agreeable guy. Michigan State is deep. At the center position, it's not like they've got a ton of established guys, but they have a, a lot of candidates, and it's hard for him to get minutes right now. But I think Sissoko shows me enough that he could be getting a lot of minutes at a lot of other programs. I'm not encouraging him to transfer or anything. Is it will get mad at me if I say something like that, but I'm just saying that's the type of quality that Michigan State has on the, on the bench, type of future that Sissoko has. 
They just have to find him some minutes. And I think as a 13th, 12th man, he is a quality guy with a lot of upside. And I don't know how much better he could be by February. I really don't. Type of guy that could get better quickly. We've not been able to watch practice for obvious reasons with COVID. So I've not seen him in practice to judge what he looks like in there. But in terms of Illinois, you may remember when Michigan State beat the Illini last year, Marcus Bingham played defense on Coburn a lot and did real well against him. Kind of upset his timing a little bit. Can he do that again, or will Coburn be more prepared? I know that Illinois has uh, Giacchisvili, or however you, however you say that, You know, more of a face-out guy. Uh, he's added some bulk. Looked pretty good in that Oregon game. Baylor game, I'm sorry. And face-up shooter type, not a guy that's going to bury you in the post a whole lot, but you know, typical European with a lot of skill, but some of that skill's inside also. And then there's the freshman. I forget his name. They've got like a six foot eight, like an active guy, not really a banger, but a versatile guy. But would they need Soko against Illinois? Might need his fouls, but with Bingham, Marble, those guys are going to be ahead of him in the pecking order for the foreseeable future, I would think. But I kind of like what Soko looks like. Um, as far as some of the other big guys around the Big Ten, Illinois is the one that, that stands out initially in terms of some of the size. I am going to go ahead and tweet and invite some people to come on in. I might even post over at the over at uh, the Underground Bunker because I'm not sure I had a post there. So give me a minute. I appreciate it. Actually, I'll do the tweet in a second. I think that should work. Let's see. Also, let's go to question number three, and then we will go over to the chat area. Feel free to post your questions in the YouTube chat area, and we will uh, get a handle on those as they come in. Always having a lot of fun with it. Always enjoy having our friends here, our SpartanMag.com subscribers, and those of you that are not subscribers, go check it out, SpartanMag.com. We will have something up later over the, the banner top of the page. I'll probably post that up later. Just you can try SpartanMag.com 30 days for free trial offer. We'd like to get you over there and test us out. See if you like it. We think that you will. So come on along with us. It's a lot of fun. And you, you're, and feel free to disagree with me on anything. You can even call me names. I don't care. But let's all get along and treat other uh, treat everyone else nicely, though. Hayden from Lake Odessa says, will Michigan State get some highly rated transfers for next year for football? Some transfers. Yes, you know, Tucker um, has made no bones about it. They're going to be into the transfer portal looking for players. In fact, at today's press conference, today being Tuesday, his weekly press conference, he said, quote, we are aggressively evaluating the portal and who is in there on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a big part in what we do in recruiting. So Tucker, they're looking at it. They know that they need to add some talent. And, you know, somebody somebody reported a couple of days ago that something like in the last six days, there have been like 140 players that have entered the transfer portal. There's a lot of players out there that assume that grass is greener elsewhere, leaving programs. And I'm not sure how many, how many of those guys are going to find what they're looking for out there in terms of scholarship opportunities, playing time. I mean, we saw that with Michigan State last year when Connor Hayward joined the portal. And I'm not sure he got the type of attention he was expecting. And I don't want to say anything disparaging about him, but he, he came crawling back to the program, and he's very fortunate that Mel Tucker allowed him back in. I don't know where he would be today without that. How many of these other guys that are going into the portal are going to find that they don't have opportunities elsewhere and wind up without a scholarship? elsewhere it's also t more tight than usual this year because seniors are being given the option of returning for another year if their coaches want them basically so coaches are making decisions on which seniors do we want how, how many slots do we have how many we, are we gonna, are we going to be bringing back and it's not an ideal year to be in the portal but there's a lot of people in the portal Michigan State's going to be looking now, can you get players from power programs to help you? I think there could be a little bit of that. 
But it's been my experience that usually players that come from a power program that have been disappointed elsewhere, there you know there might just be something wrong there. I'm not sure what it is, but you might be able to get a player here and there. Now, if you're Georgia or Ohio State, sure, you're going to be able to get some excellent players. If you're Michigan State, are you going to be getting somebody else's you know, backup player, and he comes in with backup ability. You know, a couple of years ago, they had the defensive tackle from Nebraska that came in. They needed him because Michigan State was weak at defensive tackle that year. I don't know, was that 2016 that year? I forget his name now. But he came in, and he never started at Nebraska. Came into Michigan State, started, and he was functional. They needed him. They would have been worse off without him. But it's not like he's going to come in and be an all-Big Ten type of guy. Now, there was Trevor Anderson, who came from Cincinnati, Back, uh, you know, when D'Antonio was first getting started. And Anderson was a guy out of Detroit that D'Antonio had at the University of Cincinnati. Came up, sat out, sat out a year, played for Michigan State, I think in two, you know, 2008, 2009. He was a good player. Good player. Not a great player, but a good one. Now, that's a guy, you know, coming up from a mid-major plus. At the time, Cincinnati was a mid-major plus. You know, he was moving up in weight class coming to the Big Ten. And I think that's where you can get players. If you know, I, I you know, Michigan State needs tight ends, linebacker. You know, there's talk that they might be looking at the quarterback position. You know, offensive tackle if AJR Curry doesn't come back. You know, they've got a junior college offensive tackle coming in, Baldwin. I'm not sure how ready he's going to play. Didn't play this year. That guy might be someone a little bit down the road. So maybe an offensive tackle. So can you get players from major conference powerhouses to come to Michigan State? I don't know. Yeah, you can, but can you get someone who's really going to help? I wonder if you can get better players from the MAC or the Sun Belt. You know, give me a, a standout offensive tackle. Who's the best offensive tackle in the MAC this year? I don't even know. But if AJR Curry leaves, I want I want to reach out to that guy somehow. Who's the best offensive tackle in the Sun Belt? Does Louisiana have somebody? Does App State have somebody? Does Coastal Carolina have somebody? Um. Those would be the guys that might be all conference somewhere else that might be looking to move up in weight class. Similarly, a couple of years ago, Michigan State looked at Michael Dana, who was an all conference defensive end at Central Michigan. Michigan State liked him, and the Michigan Wolverines liked him. He ended up going to Michigan, came off the bench, had a decent year, got drafted. You know, didn't start, but Mac player. So, a combination of all those things, I know they're looking into it. You know, there's. Um, EA, now Teote, the linebacker from USC. Justin Finn doing a really good job. Corey Robinson doing a good job. Ear to the ground on that one. Uh, big time talent, 6'2", 250. Was a five-star, like a national top 25 player. Went to USC, made a lot of noise as a freshman. Started half of his year as a sophomore last year. And then I'm not really sure what's, what happened this year. I'm looking into it, trying to find out. But that he's the older brother of Ma'a, not now Teote, who's a linebacker that Michigan State's been recruiting all summer and fall. So now his brother's in the portal. And, you know, Michigan State's in there. I don't know if Michigan State's what he had in mind. If, if Michigan State gets his brother, um, does that increase Michigan State's chances of getting him? Michigan State can advertise early playing time, I would think. I would know. So, again, still trying to find out why EA, now, now Teote, what happened with him at USC. USC's undefeated right now. Why would he enter the portal? I'm not sure. But watching his film, I was looking at his film at USC, and I'm seeing a tank of a guy playing low and hitting people and also being able to, you know, shuffle at the linebacker position, plant, and on one foot, cut, get downhill, low, and pop somebody at his size he's got the feet to turn on a dime change of direction agility it's and I was like man I was like that that guy that guy looks like an Alabama type of player and then I looked up his recruiting profile and saw that he was a 6.15 star and I was like okay that makes sense and he's going to be a junior I would imagine with his background and what he's done in the past that he would want to be a uh, a one and done type of type of player. Can Michigan State offer that type of situation? I would imagine so, but there's going to be other schools in on him as well. All right, let me go over here to the chat area. Check things out. 
Got a few posts over here. Feel free to make some posts. And we'll answer some of these. All right, Brad Fashenko checking in. Good to have Brad here. Mr. Bone Man checking in from Harper Woods. Angelo Gross Enthusiast is here. Angelo Gross, Gross Enthusiast is very enthusiastic. And he's shown up like the last three or four straight Spartan Meg Live sessions. And he's extremely enthusiastic. He's a newcomer. And we like that. We like that. It shows we're doing a good job recruiting out here. And you can help us recruit by word of mouth. Tell people we're cool. And give us a thumbs up because that helps. It helps with the with the with uh, all the analytics and everything for people that are Michigan State fans that are looking at their YouTube feed. If there's a Michigan State site that's getting thumbs up, it might go in front of the eyeballs of other Michigan State fans. And that's how we get more people in the SpartanMag.com com community. That's how we make more friends, right, people? Rob South says, what's up, fellas? And Rooster Cheese says, howdy, gentlemen. Rooster Cheese is a brand new recruit. And he's in the starting lineup today, the starting five. Brad Fashenko, Mr. Bone Man, Angelo Gross Enthusiast, Rob South, and Rooster Cheese. Appreciate that. Call me Kirk. Checking in. Doors Fan 91. He's a venerable, multi-year letterman. He says, any news what has gone on with Bates and Adkins at the Ypsilanti school they were both playing at. Okay, Imani Bates, Jaden Akins. A couple of big-time Michigan State basketball commitments. Jaden Akins, originally from Farmington. He's a senior right now in high school. He enrolled at Ipsy Prep Academy, which is the new school that Imani Bates' father founded. Imani Bates being arguably the best, high the best teenaged player in the world Committed to Michigan State from Ypsilanti, Michigan, Ypsilanti Lincoln High School previously, now Ypsilanti Prep Academy. Now, um, yeah, there, we, we talked about this over there at the Final Forum message board, and there was a little bit of a spat there, you know, a little bit of disagreement between Aikens and Bates. Nothing new here. I'm not spilling any beans that people don't already know. It's a couple of very talented players getting to know one another in terms of sharing the basketball. And there were some body language problems there. So a couple of guys that are teenagers, that are excellent talents, that uh, probably both sides need to grow up a little bit. And I think some people are going to help them along to get there. Now there was some scuttlebutt that Jaden Akins was going to be leaving school or kicked out of school or whatever. I don't know if any of that's true. I would anticipate Michigan State having some people that might help in that process. But I've not heard the latest in terms of Jaden Akins and whether he's still on the team and those type of things. People watching right now may know, and they can go ahead and post, but as of the last 24 hours, I have not heard. But Aikens has signed with Michigan State, and Bates could potentially reclassify after this season and sign and enroll next year with Aikens. But wouldn't be the first time that two prospective recruits have had a little trouble seeing eye to eye. A little bit strange that they're on the same team, but it's a growing process. But uh, you know, that's all. That's all I'm going to say about that right now. Big Will says, "I'm going to be really disappointed if Peyton Thorne is not named the starting quarterback. He deserves a chance to start." I would agree with that. I'd like to see it also. You're a Michigan State fan. I'm a Michigan State reporter and observer. I'd like to see it just to get an idea of what he looks like for the future. Uh, nothing against Rocky Lombardi, but um, we kind of know what Rocky Lombardi is now. You know, he, he I thought, went up in the first two games this year. Now he's kind of flatlined a little bit since then. Hard to look good against Ohio State, but I thought Thorne looked better than Lombardi did. And I think that's the, is that the second time that he's gotten in and looked better? Yeah, Indiana game and this one. So just to take inventory and to, to get an idea of what uh, to evaluate your own talent, let him start for a week, have let him have the pressure and the responsibility for an entire week going into a game, and let's see what that looks like in quarter number one, number two. Maybe he'll make the same errors and and uh, turnovers that Rocky Lombardi did against Indiana and Iowa. I don't know, but we've seen him a little bit. It's not completely an unknown is undefeated type situation. But you know, today at the press conference. Uh, Mel Tucker said that they're still evaluating it and they would expect to know by Wednesday of this week who the starting quarterback is going to be for Michigan State. They're going to know by Wednesday. They expect for the team to know that. 
But it sounded to me like today being Tuesday, they were going to have a practice today and evaluate the first day of practice. Bloody Tuesday practice. You know, very physical practice. Pads on. Look at it today. I'm anticipating it's going to be Peyton Thorne. We in the public and in the media, we are not going to know before Saturday. We will find out Saturday just before game time, I would imagine. Let's go to question number four from the mailbag over at SpartanMag.com. Same question. Mike from Clarkston. And his handle over at SpartanMag.com is the Crunchy Bucket. The Crunchy Bucket. I can respect that. The Crunchy Bucket. And I looked it up, and Crunchy Bucket has been a subscriber at SpartanMag.com since October. So somewhat of a somewhat of a uh, newcomer to SpartanMag.com, the Crunchy Bucket. Mike from Clarkston, thanks for chiming in with the question. He says, Jim, who do you think gets the nod at quarterback this Saturday, Peyton Thorne or Rocky Lombardi, assuming Rocky's healthy? He says, Peyton, for the most part, seems to do well with his in-game reps, but is yet to be handed the keys. You're exactly right. And yes, assuming that Rocky is healthy. And today, today, um, Mel Tucker said uh, all things looked like Rocky Lombardi was coming along nicely. He didn't have any specifics. Um, you know, it was Tuesday. They had had like uh, you know a light practice either on Sunday or Monday. I don't remember what day is the day off. I think Monday's the day off, and they get in and do some light workouts on Sunday. So as far as he saw, things were looking okay with Lombardi. But it it was interesting that he didn't have more definitive on Lombardi. Maybe he's trying to keep Penn State in the dark a little, but I don't know. But for the reasons I just said, yeah, I would expect I would expect Thorne to be the guy. I kind of expected Thorne to start against Northwestern, but Lombardi started, and that turned out to be a good decision. He did well against Northwestern. Had a big win. And uh, then against Ohio State, you saw what happened. Lombardi came out 5 out of 11, 33 yards, one interception in in the end zone. I didn't get a real good look at the interception in the end zone. Was the arm slot wrong? I'm not sure. Could that have been prevented or was it one of those football things? I'm not sure, but 5 out of 11 for for 33 yards. And once again, to me, the most troubling thing was those little passes out to the flat or to the sideline routes, those comebacks, curls. It's like sometimes you throw a comeback and the receiver would, throw, would run a curl. We saw that happen three times against Northwestern. Happened at least twice against Ohio State to the point where I'm not sure if he and the receivers are not on the same page or if he was just that inaccurate. Either one is not great. If it's an inaccuracy thing, that's a big problem. You know, he had worked to improve his accuracy and his accuracy did look better for a couple of weeks. Um, but it's kind of flatlined and gone south a little bit since then. Peyton Thorne gets in there, and right away the offense was just clicking better, facing the same defense at the end of the second quarter. And, you know, he's finding the short routes. He's finding the, sh- the tight end short over the middle with just little sit-down routes in front of that zone. Completes his first 11 passes. The offense starts moving a little bit. I think it was a third-and-one zone read keeper. Picks it up, gets hit, fumble. Ball security's got to be better, obviously. So he's making a, a, an error there that Michigan State – suffered from in the first two weeks other people have not turned it over as much since then and he fumbles it and he says hey i gotta hold it high and tight gotta hold it better he's not the biggest most physically strong guy rocky lombardi's bigger and more physically strong a couple years older peyton thorne's got quick feet can get out of trouble in the scramble get out of trouble to elongate a play keep his eyes downfield make a throw on the run that looks good zone read option keeper scored on a touchdown uh he's got some um mobility some footwork but the more that you put that footwork to use the more often he's going to take some shots and he took a shot in the backfield once from the pocket throwing took a hit and was a little bit slow to get up like I said not the biggest guy so it remains to be seen how many shots he can take that's part of the game but I hear really good things about his mental ability as a quarterback the previous staff I had heard from another source Chris Trinum. Chris Trinum. Coming in strong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Chris Trinum. I think I'm going to be outside in front of Toys R Us next week. No, I won't. I would. I, I, I respect those people, but I, I won't be doing that. I'm busy. But just I'm not sure Toys R Us is still open. But anyway... Happy holidays to everybody once again. Chris Trinum, thanks again for the personal sponsorship. 
Really appreciate that. $25 is great. And um, anything, uh, uh, all that's always greatly appreciated. Including the $2 and the $3. Those are great too. We appreciate it. It helps. Helps our small business. Is Small Business Monday still is it over? Yeah, I think so. Anyway, thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Um, so Thorne, you know, over the middle, you know, sit down, you know, those guys, Tyler Hunt two or three times, and you just wonder, you know, were those things available for Lombardi also? I didn't see a whole lot of differences in the route combinations and the plays that were being run, and Thorne was just getting it tempo, decisive, getting rid of it, not holding the ball too long. Um, threw the one interception on a slant, led him too much. Defensive back made a really a great diving catch. You saw it. Not a bad read, just inaccurate. Tucker said today he wants accuracy. Something interesting that Mel Tucker said about the quarterback situation and what he's looking for. He did not elaborate with his evaluation about the quarterbacks. Didn't, didn't say much about it at all. I don't think he wants that to play out in the funny papers. But he said, you know, he's looking for the quarterback to be the number one competitor on the team or at least the number one competitor on the offense. It's the first time I've heard him say that. And that, I think, explains a little bit why he's been so enamored with Rocky Lombardi because Rocky Lombardi is a heck of a competitor. And he also wants somebody who's a leader. And he was impressed in the first game that Rocky Lombardi did not get rattled. All, all those things, I think that there was there was some some mental and psychological attributes and physical attributes that I think really appealed to Mel Tucker as they were trying to establish a level, a baseline of consistency, which they have not established. And I had heard that that Lombardi was a little uh, less likely to make mistakes in practice during the preseason. And I heard that Thorne was reasonably satisfied with his role at the outset of the season. You know, back at the beginning of the year, I, I thought, you know, back in August, my forecast would have been that Lombardi would start, but Peyton Thorne would become the starter at some point in the season. I suspected it might happen after, after the Michigan loss. Well, they beat Michigan, and Lombardi was heroic that day, and everybody likes Lombardi, and, it, and his teammates respond to him as a leader. I got great respect for him. But the reads, the accuracy is just not quite where it needs to be. Maybe it can still get better, but Thorne's come in and done some good things. I would imagine Thorne's going to get the nod this week. And prior to the Northwestern game, Tucker kind of mentioned a little bit about, you know, the quarterback situation, but not much. He was asked about it. This week, he said they're still evaluating it. I'm not sure he even came out and said they were still evaluating it last time around after the after the Indiana and Iowa games prior to the Northwestern game. I don't think he even acknowledged there was an evaluation going on. He said there was a competition, but then he said there's competition at every position every day. So that kind of lessens the the meaning of those words. And I understand why he, he stated it that way. But this week, it just seems like he's acknowledging there's more of a decision to be made, saying there's going to be a decision made by Wednesday. So, again... Um, uh, it's a, It sounds like it's more up for grabs this week than it was prior to the Northwestern game. And for those reasons, and also a second time that Thorne has come in and looked and sparked the offense. I mean, you saw it. They drove, turned it over, got it again in the second quarter or second half, drove, touchdown, and then interception, then drove again, field goal. You know, he, he was productive. 16 out of 25, 147 yards. By that time... Ohio State was playing a lot of zone and maybe giving up, you know, later, midway through the second half, maybe giving up more things underneath. Against Indiana, Indiana was giving up nothing. Indiana came at him with blitzes. I think he attempted 20 passes against Indiana. 20 of them, he faced blitzes. And that Indiana pass defense, he won't face a better pass defense the rest of the year. Of course, there's the Penn State game, crossover game. And if you win two, possibly a bowl game. So, there's that. Question number five. I didn't write down who this was from. Error on my part. Anyway, the question is, we've heard different numbers on this year's recruiting class in terms of a potential number 
of transfer portal players. What is your best guess to the number of each when all is said and done with the roster heading into the spring? Well, right now, Michigan State has 18 committed players. Mel Tucker recruits. Mel Tucker keeps saying that he expects to have a 25-man class. Um, I'm not saying he keeps saying that, but he indicated that during the summer and again on one of his radio shows recently. He said some would be able to be back counted to last year. So I think last year, would Michigan State sign? 21 or 22? So if somebody... I don't know how that works. If somebody is on scholarship by January 1st, they can be back counted, maybe? Something like that? I don't know. They don't say a whole lot about it because they don't want the competitors to know how many slots are out there. Sometimes they don't want the recruits to know how many slots are out there. So, you know, I've heard people talking about maybe taking... 10 or 20 in the transfer portal. I don't think that's possible. I think that any more than three or four in the transfer portal in one year is, is a lot. I think that's excessive. You get five or six or seven. I don't know if teams do that, but if you get five or six or seven in the transfer portal, you're just, I mean, your culture, you know, you're, you're having to reteach things to some veteran players. And I know Kansas state's had success with junior college players in the past under Snyder, but I mean, three or four sounds like a lot to me. So people that are expecting 25 recruits and 20 new people in the transfer portal and 45 new faces, uh, that's not going to happen. I'm thinking a 25-man class and maybe three or four transfers of some sort. That's my guess. We don't know. We've never. We've not seen this. We've never. We've not seen this staff operate in the portal. We don't know what they think about their roster and how many people are going to be escorted to the transfer portal like Anthony Williams and uh, Luke Fulton. So I don't know how many openings they're going to have, but I'm just kind of, I'm expecting a 25 man class and maybe three or four transfers could be wrong. I'm talking about scholarship transfers. So we'll just have to wait and see about that. So the beer guy says, What's the percentage that you give of Michigan State securing Audric Estime? It seems like things are trending away from Michigan State. Yeah, Audric Estime, the running back from New Jersey, four-star, borderline top 100 guy, explosive, physical, agile, running back, one of uh, maybe the... Uh, one of the top two or three recruits in this recruiting class, one of four four star recruits that are currently committed to Michigan State. And yeah, he's been, you know, there's been some talk about Notre Dame. I mean, he goes to St. Joe's Mondale in New Jersey. It's a private school, it's a Catholic school. So Notre Dame does well with some of those schools and some of those networks. They like players that have gone through processes like that. And Notre Dame's not offered yet, but Notre Dame has shown that when they offer, I mean, since the beginning of time, when they offer, and that's not a Notre Dame helmet back there, that's an Army helmet. When Notre Dame offers, um, it has an impact. And especially this year when they're undefeated, had a good year last year, they're recruiting at a high level. I mean, we saw that when JoJo Johnson, the kid from northern Indiana, Michigan State was recruiting him, having a good shot at him. Thought they were going to get him, and then boom, Notre Dame offers. Two days later, commits to Notre Dame. Notre Dame's got some pull. So, Notre Dame, I don't think, is offered SMA yet. If they do, yeah, that's a problem for Michigan State, I would think. So, you're asking me what are the percentage chances. I guess what I'm saying is, what are the percentage chances Notre Dame offers? I think if Notre Dame offers, I think Michigan State's chances of keeping him are under 50%. Meanwhile, Rutgers keeps hammering away at him. He's a New Jersey kid, New Jersey college. His former... High school head coach is now running backs coach at Rutgers, and he keeps recruiting him for good reason. I think initially there was more respect for Michigan State than the in-state program. Rutgers has won a couple of games. Spirits are higher there. They've been doing some exciting things with trick plays and onside kicks and special teams laterals. So they're trying to capture some imagination there. Rutgers beat Purdue last week, almost beat Michigan. So you can't argue that that Rutgers looks like they're rallying a little bit. I'm not saying, and you know, Justin Thind and Corey Robinson have done a good job covering this recruitment, and they've said all along that Notre Dame's a bigger threat than Rutgers. 
But Rutgers came at him hard, continued to come at him hard, and the, the news organizations in New Jersey, the writers, asked him about Rutgers. He's talked about Rutgers even after he committed to Michigan State and saying that he's you know still interested in Rutgers and listening to them. He's probably saying that out of respect to Rutgers. But just the fact that he's still listening to Rutgers keeps the apple cart just upset just enough. And even if Rutgers does not end up getting him, there's a psychological thing there that if Rutgers keeps its foot in the door, keeps its foot in the door so that he's not 100% committed, he says he is, but he's still listening, um, it, that might not work for Rutgers, but it keeps the apple cart upset just enough so that he's like thinking about it, thinking about it. Then all of a sudden Notre Dame can come in, offer and change the whole game. So Rutgers might not get him, but upsetting the apple, apple cart enough, keeping a foot in the door or whatever metaphor and analogy you want to use, Rutgers can unintentionally help Notre Dame anytime, you know, anytime that so, you're trying to get someone to decommit, the more the merrier. If you're trying to get somebody to decommit from Penn State, you're happy if Boston College is in there too trying to knock on the door. You just anything to do to upset the apple cart. So Michigan State's got that to work against them in trying to hold off Notre Dame. So adding that all together, it's it's uh, you know, Michigan State's got a lot of work to do. They know that. And if Notre Dame offers, I think the chances go below fifty percent. I would be impressed with Michigan State. If Notre Dame offers and Michigan State manages to hold on to him, if that happens, then that tells us a little bit more about Michigan State as recruiters. And we're learning as we go in observing Mel Tucker and his staff as recruiters. We've not been watching them for a long time and how they recruit at Michigan State. <clears throat> um, been impressed with some of the commitments they've gotten outside of the region this year. That's been a little bit different. And we'll see if they can hold on to this one. It was easier to handicap things with D'Antonio because we'd seen him recruit for 13 or 14 years. So if something happened like a potential decommitment, um, you know, you just kind of knew how D'Antonio was going to handle it and might not, you know, dig in and really fight to keep a guy because he was offended when somebody would look elsewhere. Still learning with Mel Tucker and how good a job, how much they'll fight, how successfully they'll be able to fight to keep a four-star commitment from out of state. If Michigan State had won more games this year, would that have helped? Absolutely. All right, we're going to probably have a short program today. Sometimes we go two hours. Going to get through about three more questions here, then back over to the chat area, and we're going to wrap it up. Um, on Wednesday, if you're watching this after Wednesday, we expect to have post-game coverage of Michigan State's game against Virginia in the ACC Big Ten Challenge. Michigan State 5-0. and I think the Tom Izzo Spartans are ranked, what, number six in the country, something like that? 5-0, and Izzo was hoping to get some, uh, was hoping to get a good practice in today and then traveling out today. He was juggling a situation in which they'd played five games in 12 days. The legs were tired. Rocket Watts' legs were tired. That's why he did not finish the Western Michigan game. He was driven to the rim three times for finishes. Not like him. Legs were tired. Izzo accepted that, liked the way Rocket Watts played in a lot of ways in terms of continually improving as a quarter, an offensive quarterback, a facil facilitator. He wants to be a guy that can pass the ball. He was excited and proud that he had six assists against Western Michigan. So I think the Rocket Watts project at point guard is on schedule and looking good. So you got that. And then um, trying to figure out what's going on with the big men. But fatigue-wise, yeah, they've got a lot of depth, but still five games in 12 days, and Joshua Langford sitting out a game might have had the liveliest legs of anybody. Joey Hauser, tired legs or not, made six three-pointers, so it affects some people differently. But Izzo was bothered because he was unable to have pregame practices prior to the Western Michigan game because they'd just played Friday night and then they played again on Sunday. So they did a walkthrough on Saturday. They're preparing for a team with nothing but walkthroughs and film sessions, and they are big on practice preparation the proper way. So they didn't have their usual prep, and I realize that's the case every year if you play in Maui or one of those day-after-day-after-day -day -day tournaments. That's one of the reasons Izzo's record is so good in other facets of the game, but his record's not been great with 
those uh, tournaments, those those tournaments where you play three games in three days because you can't really have the practice install, you know, full-blown practice. Against U of D, it was Michigan State's fourth game. It should have been an advantage for Michigan State. It was U of D's first game. And Izzo said flat out there were two or three players out there. We had zero, zero uh, scouting reports on. And they gave up some field goals here and there because they didn't have the players didn't know how they drove or what they did. Michigan State's big on knowing what you do as a team, what you do individually, and cutting off what you like to do, making you play left-handed. U of D comes out there sight unseen. That's one of the reasons that game stayed close. So Izzo's not panicking about those games being close. He'd like to be able to play some of those games with a full chance to prepare. That being said, U of D's going in there for the first game of the year, so it wasn't ideal for them either in terms of being ready to play, but it probably was a net positive for U of D because they were more secretive on things. So with Michigan State, now Izzo is looking forward to getting some practice in. On the other hand, he had some tired legs based on five games in 12 days. So 9.30 game at Virginia, and he's already complaining about late game and not getting back till 4 in the morning the following day. So let's see. Then their next game is going to be Sunday against Oakland University. They'll have time to prepare for that. But these Big Ten ACC Challenge games are important to Izzo. And it just seems like every other year there's a problem in trying to get prepared in time. You know, there there have been like the time they played North Carolina at Ford Field in the regular season. Michigan State had just gotten back from Hawaii and... um. That's, you know, when you travel and then, you know how it is. And the same thing happened when Michigan State played North Carolina State here at Breslin in the ACC Challenge probably seven or eight years ago. NC State had just come off the Great Alaska Shootout or Hawaii or something. They came in, traveled one day, came to East Lansing, and they had zero in the tank. And that game was over immediately, but travel has something to do with it. Virginia... It's three and one. They lost to USF. That's San Francisco. Some of you, some of you old timers, might remember when San Francisco used to be really good in basketball. I mean, in the fifties, they were a, a power for a number of years, and then they had Bill Russell, probably in the fifties, and then like in the mid to late seventies, they had a long win streak. They had like a thirty game win streak. They were number one in the country, and of course, Notre Dame ended the win streak, knocked them off. I don't know how it is or why it is, but in sports, um. Sports lore and the way planets align for sports. So often, Notre Dame ends up being the team that shows up to end an unbeaten streak. Digger Phelps and those guys, they knocked off. Lou Alcindor and UCLA stopped their win streak, stopped that USF win streak. They stopped Bud Wilkinson's Oklahoma win streak in the 50s. They've stopped other win streaks. I don't know. San Francisco. Anyway, Virginia lost to San Francisco. One of the bigger upsets of the year so far. They've beaten Towson. They beat St. Francis of Pennsylvania by 15. Most recently, they beat Kent State in overtime. 3-1. and one. Defending national champions two years ago. The year before that, they lost to, what, Maryland-Baltimore County. In the first round, first time a 16 seed ever beat a 1 seed. You know they're going to be physical. You know they're going to run their blocker mover offense. They're going to do it well. Michigan State's going to have to kind of report on it. Izzo says they've got better shooters than last year. I don't know. I was hoping to get a chance to watch Virginia play before doing this. Didn't get a chance to. Maybe I will tonight after this. But anyway, let's finish up the mailbag. Then we'll go over here to the chat area. Go ahead and ask some more chat questions if you like. All right. Alex from Shelton, Washington. I think that's a new one from... I don't think we've had a question from Alex from Shelton, Washington. Shelton, Washington. Welcome aboard, Alex. He says, which seniors do you think will return next year? Is Naquan, Naquan Jones likely to depart? Jacob Panashuk. Only nine seniors playing regularly. Well, my, that's my note. There's only nine seniors playing regularly right now. Na Naquan Jones played well against Ohio State, especially when he was one-gapping. I thought he was quick. And Ohio State's offensive linemen were having a lot of trouble keeping him out of there. I know that the Ohio State was without three starters on the offensive line, but Naquan Jones played well for a third straight game. You know, 
Naquan Jones playing well, fifth year senior, probably time for him to go. I would, you know, maybe he likes college. Maybe he wants to hang around. I'm sure the Michigan State will invite him to stay. But, um, if you, you know, he started for one year. He's shown some things. At some point, you know, do you really want to come back and, and go through 12 more games just to keep your stock where it is? Do you think you've got a chance to improve your stock? I just have a feeling that uh, Naquan Jones might be ready to go, might be advised to go. Probably a good decision. Now, Tucker was asked about it today, and he didn't give any specifics on numbers about which seniors might be going, but his quote is, he said, quote, we will take it on an individual basis, and then we will make decisions on those guys, and guys will make decisions whether they want to come back or not. It's a collaborative effort, and it's communication. So we will just have to see. There are some that may come back, but we'll just have to see because everyone is going to make a decision based on what's in their best interest. It's really a fluid process. So people are going to make a decision based on their best interest as players, and Michigan State as a program is going to make a decision what's in their best interest in terms of the program as they see it. So a player will make a decision based on what's best for him. The program will make a decision based on what's best for the program. Um, actually, I've got – there's 10 players – that I can count right now that are playing on a regular basis. So I think Naquan Jones, Antoine Simmons, I, you know, Na I think Antoine Simmons might be as good as he's going to get. So go and start to get paid, see if you can make a team, get drafted. I think they go. Jacob Panishuk, probably going to listen to his brother a little bit. His brother's been in various camps. I think he's still on a taxi squad. He'll be able to give his brother some information about what it would look like for him. I'm sure if, if Mike Panishuk has an agent, probably going to represent Jacob also, they'll make an informed decision there. I suspect that the coaches would invite all three of those back. I suspect all three are going to go. I would suspect that the coaches would invite A.J.R. Curry back. And A.J.R. Curry got beat for a sack last week, but that's the first time he's gotten beat for a sack all year. And it happened infrequently last season. He's gotten a little bit better with his run blocking, with his slope of improvement if he continues to improve his run blocking. You know, maybe he enjoys playing for Kapilovic. Maybe he enjoys the new strength coach. Maybe he believes that he can really become a better player if he stays and become an NFL prospect. But he's a guy that was injured earlier in his career. Sometimes guys are done with football and they're just ready to be done. I'm not sure. We've not had a chance to interview A.J.R. Curry ever. Uh, I mean, we could have requested him last year, but um, didn't maybe he was out a little bit last year, but I didn't talk to him. And then this year, the only interviews are through Zoom for obvious reasons, and he's not been out yet. But I would expect that they would invite AJ R. Curry back. I'm just not where I'm not sure where our Curry stands. But I think our Curry and Matt Dotson are two guys that might benefit from another year. Matt Dotson was injured in the Michigan game, former four star recruit, athletic guy, added some weight last year, took a little bit off this year, got injured in the Michigan game, he'd been out ever since. Played against Ohio State, a handful of snaps. Had a reception over there in the left flat. You saw him lower his shoulder and break a tackle and, and go through the next bit of contact for extra yardage. And, hey, um, I thought that uh, I thought Matt Dotson looked like he's got a lot, of, a lot still left in the tank. And I, I wonder, you know, he's had some injuries. He's not had... He's, you know, he's done okay, but, you know, players are always, always believe in themselves, and he probably believes that he could be an impact guy, an all-Big Ten type of guy. I'm not sure if he could. You know, things kind of went one way or another with D'Antonio and the previous offensive staff. I mean, they liked him, but if, if, you're, if your career has just kind of been not what you thought it was going to be, then there's a new coach coming in. Okay, a new beginning. And this coach says he's really going to utilize the tight ends. Okay, great. That sounds great for me. I'm excited. I'm fired up. Go out get injured. In, the, in what, the second game. <clears throat> I could see him wanting to come back. Would they invite him back? I would imagine so, because Michigan State is low on tight ends. But part of that's going to be, you know, okay, G, our kind of guy. I don't know. Behind the scenes, is Dotson the type of guy that they think is completely committed to the program? I, don't, I have no reason to think that he's not, but 
how they see him as a worker and dedication to the program would have an impact on that, whether they invite him back or not. So I think those guys are interesting ones. You know, Beasley's an interesting one. And I can't remember if we talked about this earlier or not, but Beasley says, you know, Beasley was, Drew Beasley was available for interviews today. Usually there's two players per week that are available for interviews. Today it was Drew Beasley and Tyler Hunt, a couple of former walk-ons that are doing good things this year. Uh, Beasley said, you know, was asked if he would be interested in coming back and playing next year because he's a senior right now. Let's see here. I think he's a business major. And I think he might have been, he's two-time academic all Big Ten. So at what point do you guys want to just go ahead and graduate and start their careers? I'm not sure. He's an econ major. He's an economics major. Two-times academic all Big Ten. Warren D. LaSalle. It sounded to me like Beasley's interested. He was asked about it today, and he said, quote, Coming back next year as a, as a senior, an extra year as a senior. He's a senior right now. He's a redshirt senior right now. Coming back next year for a sixth year, which I should have mentioned this earlier. If you didn't know, everybody in the country this season does not count against anybody's eligibility. And you can return the next year if the program wants to keep you. And it's my understanding next year that you're allowed to have more than 85 scholarship guys for, I think, one year. Then the next year, it's got to go back to 85. I put some questions out about that. Ethan Marlowe thanks a lot Ethan really appreciate it thanks for checking in thanks for the personal sponsorship Spartan Mag Live greatly appreciate it thanks Ethan Marlowe oh and I think you might have had a question too the way this works is if you ring the bell your question goes to the front let's see okay Chris Trinum did that also he said and I, I and I neglected to answer his questions that's a foul on me foul I feel bad. But a long time ago, Chris Trinum asked, Jim, would it be possible for you to do a COVID year in review in February with the other mods as it pertains to Tucker's on-field performance and recruiting in this odd year? Also, any thoughts on Mangum at Colorado? Mangum hasn't gotten a, much, a lot of work as a backup running back at Colorado last year as a freshman. Had like 400 yards, guy from Cast Tech. This year, freshman's come in and taken a lot of the carries. I've not seen him play. I think there is some interest there to possibly look elsewhere. I don't know if Michigan State has room at that position. I don't, you know, I don't know where Michigan State is in terms of their interest there. But that's an interesting one. A guy from Detroit that went out to Colorado with him. Then he came, comes, then Tucker comes to Michigan State. Michigan State's recruiting his younger brother who's a standout at Birmingham Groves, wide receiver DB. Uh, he's got some toughness, got a frame, at least six foot two, a lot of skill. I mean, that guy looks like a four-star guy to me. I think Rivals has him as a three, but if Makari Page, who went to Michigan, was a four-star, his junior film is better than Makari Page's was. He should be a four-star, in my opinion. Um, but what, you're asking what? Um, would it be possible to do a COVID year in review in February with other mods as it pertains to Tucker's on-field performance and recruiting. Yeah, you know, we could do that February. Yeah, we could do that after the February signing day. You know, usually we do, you know, when we when we do the when the recruiting year is over, you know, we usually have a podcast. We usually do that anyway. In one form or another, we review the entire year, who got away, who didn't, all those things. So I would imagine so. Yeah, it's good 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 thought. Good point. Ethan Marlowe says, Count, much appreciated. Just sliding in for the jar, absent to the party, watching our hands bros, hands bros mean cousin battle North Carolina. We'll listen in the morning. First question may have been mine. Go green. Thanks, Ethan. Appreciate that. Getting back to the number of seniors. Um, oh, Beasley. Yeah, Drew Beasley said, when asked, you know, Beasley, econ major, fifth-year senior right now. He's already redshirted. He'll have a chance to come back for a sixth year if the program wants him. He was asked, is he interested in coming back for a sixth year? He said today, he said, quote, that is something I have given some thought. Actually, that's not the way he said it. He said, quote, he said, that is something I have given some thought. 
but that is something I still have to talk to Coach Tucker and the rest, so I can't comment on that yet. So, very smart decision for him to not come out and say, yeah, I want to come back. Put pressure on the coaches to make sure I come back. He's, he's, he's thought about it. He obviously has a feeling about it, but he doesn't feel it's in his best interest to mention what his feelings are. So, I think that's pretty smart. Sounds like he wants to come back. Maybe he, needs to talk to, maybe he wants to talk to the coaches a little bit about where they think he fits in, but he can look around and kind of see where he would fit in. Does Jacob Panisic leave? Michael Fletcher's coming around. Avery Dunn's been, pra- been traveling, but we've not seen him on the f- field yet. Are they going to go after a transfer portal defensive end somewhere else? Possibly. You know, Piotrowski's played a little bit as a true freshman. They could use Beasley. How's he feeling? Seems to be okay. So other ones, Shaq Brown, Trey Person. Um, Trey Person starting on a regular basis every year now. That's a senior. Shaq Brown's a senior. They're both fourth-year seniors. Those guys never redshirted. I asked Mike Tressel about a month ago about the new rule and whether the new rule could be good for someone like Trey Person, who's finally getting in there, finally getting you know, coached by Mike Tressel and different coaches, Harlan Barnett probably to an extent a little bit also. And Tressel said something very similar to what Drew Beasley said. He said, yeah, you know, that's an interesting rule. Um, I have to wait and see. It depends on what, you know, what Coach Tucker says could be something good for him, but was very noncommittal about it. At the safety position, you got Michael Dowell. You got Xavier Henderson coming back for another year, scheduled to. At safety, you know, I think they might like to have Trey Person back. They might look to, to invite him back. A, you know, a good senior, probably not going to get drafted. Come back, he could elevate his game. Shaq Brown. Could Shaq Brown get in, get drafted this year? Five interceptions, tackling well, had a nice big hit last week. He's not perfect, but he's pretty good. He's got a frame. I think there's a chance Shaq Brown could get drafted this year. Maybe I don't know. I'm not a I'm not an NFL talent evaluator, but um, it would depend on what he, he what kind of forty yard dash time and how he tests at the combines. He would be looked at. Maybe Shaq Brown goes. Maybe Trey Person comes back. I'm guessing. What about Matt Coglin, the kicker? He's had a good year. He's a business, he's a business major. He's redshirted, so I think he's graduated. Would he want to come back? I don't think he's an NFL prospect. Does he want to go out and join the real world? I don't know. The guy strikes me as someone who's having fun. The guy strikes me as someone who's having fun being a college football player. I don't know how well Olsen is doing, the true freshman kicker who's on scholarship. Olsen dressed for the Ohio State game. He's an Ohio kid, I'm pretty sure. First time he's dressed for a game this year, which I don't really understand. I'm still not sure if that's a Big Ten rule or a Michigan State rule. I think that you can dress more than 75 at home. The Michigan State's only dressed at 75. Maybe they want less confusion on the sidelines. Maybe they want fewer people going to the locker room. Maybe they want fewer people during warm-up. I'm not sure, but I don't know. They know more about it than I do, but if you're allowed to dress more than 75 at home, I would think you would want a freshman kicker to get out there, dress, run through the tunnel, experience game day, even though there's no fans there, and just go through the preseason, the pregame workout of kicking field goals out there in uniform in a game in the stadium. But maybe that's why they did it this past weekend. But Olsen's around. Do you want to have two kickers on scholarship? Olsen and Coughlin. But... Like I said, next fall it won't really count as a scholarship. By the way, if my phone runs out, it's about to run out really quickly. If it does, then thanks for tuning in. I'm going to answer these questions, and then uh, we've only got a few more minutes left on this on my phone before it runs out. Uh, Dominic Long, does he come back? Not sure. Do they ask him back? Not sure. They like him, but I'm not sure they'd ask him back. Uh, M. Johnson, 2000 says, "Comp, what are the like, lightning, lightning, the likelihoods of likeliness of Tucker landing one or both of the Naote brothers?" Uh, he says, "It seems Ma uh, is trending toward Michigan State. I would agree with that. I think Ma Na, Naito, Naote, very good chance he ends up at Michigan State, and his brother. I mean, he's the linebacker we talked about earlier from USC." I think that Michigan State's got a really good chance to get the younger brother, and I think the younger brother would like for him to come along. So that'd be an interesting one. Let me get through these questions real quick before the time runs out. 
Angelo Gross enthusiast asked the same question. Call Me Kirk says, what are your percentages that we keep estimate? I'm going like 30 to 40%. That's what Call Me Kirk says. You know, judging by, you know, what are the chances Notre Dame's going to offer? I'd probably be around the same area. Rooster Cheese says, any chance Snow can move to the Will linebacker position next year? We need athletes on the field. Yeah, he doesn't want to be a linebacker, but he might see the writing on the wall there. I, I've watched him on special teams. Looks like he moves pretty well. Maybe he can play the nickel or safety like Michael Dowell does. Maybe not quite a linebacker yet, but he could he could uh, he could develop into that. I don't. I think he looks more like a safety maybe than I anticipated initially when he first committed. So I'm going to say chances are he remains a safety, a Michael Dowell type of safety. And in this program, the safety in the 4 2 5, the safety plays up at the linebacker level a lot. You've seen Dowell up there. You've seen Xavier Henderson up there. In today's football parlance, it's called a box safety, which is basically you're at the linebacker level with one single safety deep. George Z says, What's your take on the Ohio State debacle? They're obviously the best in the league. It was a debacle, and they turned most games, most Big Ten games into a debacle. There's way better than everybody in the Big Ten. And, you know, you'd, you'd hope you'd be able to compete with them. Didn't happen. Michigan State, more mistake-prone than they needed to be. They needed to be perfect in order to compete in that game. Ohio State's weakness is their pass defense. Michigan State does not have the pass offense to take advantage of their one slight weakness. Those that do have good pass offenses, like Indiana, can, uh, you know, hang in with them a little bit. Ohio State. Looks good, but Michigan State, I mean, the quarterback situation for Michigan State in the first quarter and a half really put them behind the eight ball. Three and out, three and out, three and out, three and out. Um, we talked about it at length in the post-game call-in show. You can click on that one or go check out our coverage over at SpartanMag.com post-game in the .com article that I wrote. You can see what I think there. Carter Cartero, 917, do you think Thorne starts against Penn State? Yes, I do. That's my guess. Gordon Tenona says, do Yari Todd and Jacob Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah have a future at State? Isaiah's been, you know, he's getting reps right now as a second string center in practice. He's a second string offensive lineman. Yeah, if you're second string offensive line right now, I think they, he's a young guy. They'll probably keep him around. Diari Todd, bigger question. Not sure. They moved him to defensive end. He's not gotten on the field. Drew Freshman Piotrowski's played ahead of him. Diari Todd has been dressing and traveling, but good question. Not sure. Um, he'd be a borderline guy. James Willis checking in from Bronson, Michigan. James Willis. James Quick Willis. James Willis, Alliance fan. I know some people in Bronson. You know my guy Chad out in Bronson? Brad Fashinko says, if Marcus keeps shooting from the outside, Maddie may see more time. Yeah, Izzo's not real happy with Marcus. It's okay for Marcus to shoot once in a while. He's got a decent release, and he came in. That was supposed to be part of his game, but you don't need him shooting that shot or a 20-footer from the baseline when there's still 20 seconds left on the shot clock. Izzo didn't like it, but that's been communicated, and I suspect Bingham will continue to pare down on that. Last year, I thought they shot from the three too much, but he thought that was part of his game. Didn't work out. You know, Xavier Tillman came into the season wanting to shoot more from the three. Wasn't working out. He stopped forcing it. Bingham still trying to find it there. James Willis says, do you think Imani Bates will at least play his freshman year at East Lansing? I think so, but with all the drama last week, that kind of upsets that apple cart a little bit, but I think so. I think he's going to classify early and go to Michigan State for a year. I think that his dad wants him to play for a year in a very demanding defensive-oriented system like Izzo's, be away from home but not too far away from home, get on TV, increase his Q rating, especially if they allow the name and image and likeness thing to go through. If he's able to to uh, sign a contract, complete a semester, and then start getting paid immediately on January 1st at the beginning of the next semester, which he won't be hanging around for. Chris Trinum, tardy but attentive. Mall 286 signing in from South Philadelphia. Doors Fan 91, for your information, today would have been Jim Morrison's 77th birthday. Happy birthday, Jim. Happy birthday, Jim Morrison, for sure. 77. You know, there's there's dudes out there that are 77 still recording stuff and writing stuff. I wonder what Jim Morrison would have been doing if he was still around and what he would have been doing for the past 50 years. Because he died at the age of 27, right? Wow. Um, I don't want to be old guy, but I am. Can't help it. But Springsteen's got a new song, Ghost Something or Other, and it's pretty solid. It's like something from, it sounds like it's from 1988. 
you know, so too much of his stuff in the last 20 years has been really somber and depressive and depressing. And he, he tried the Pete Seeger thing and all that stuff. That's all right or whatever. But this sounds like something from the 1980s, which if you're like me and have a, a receding hairline like me, you might appreciate. I'm not saying it's for everybody, but if you're a Springsteen fan, go to Springsteen.com and listen to the new song Ghost something or other. It's not great. It's not great. But it sounds like something that could have been out in 1988, which sounded all right. It's not like he's trying to go big and, you know, get, you know, you know, have some big tour and go up with, the, you know, put something up high in the charts. I don't think he's concerned about that. I heard something that it was the first time that he didn't like release a demo to his band and tell them what to do. It was more like the band collaborated a little bit more on this than in the past. I thought he was pretty much done with that type of sound, but that was new. And I think that, you know, good for him. And he's got to be about the same age as Jim Morrison would have been. Mr. Bone Man says, Basketball, why has Tom never landed a kid from DeMatha High School or Oak Hill Academy? It's a good question, especially considering the Carlton Valentines from there. I don't know. Uh, Cartero917 says, Toys R Us is out of business. Yeah, probably because of Brandon. Angelo Gross Enthusiast says, Comp, with Indiana getting COVID and Ohio State not getting six games, if we beat Penn State then we would be in the Big Ten Championship game assuming the rules don't change. I've heard some people say that. I don't think so. I don't think they're going to allow that kind of... Uh, they're not going to... They're not going to let that kind of loophole do something like that to the Big Ten Championship game. Mr. Bowman says, Comp, happy holidays, bro. Coach D had a strict policy with recruits. If you commit to state, you are not allowed to take a visit to another school. What is Coach Tucker's stance on that? He's never said. He's never said what he thinks about that. I think he just expects to continue to recruit who he wants to recruit all the way through. Gordon Tenona says, Notre Dame beat UCLA on Dwight the Iceman Clay's shot. Detroit what says, Detroit Spartan says, Detroit what? Brendan Bialis says, hello? Detroit Spartan, plan A Bama offer. Talking about Mangum. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Mangum kid. Got the Alabama offer a couple weeks ago. Sounds like it's a, a committable offer. I did talk to his dad a little bit about that, and he said Alabama's been in contact with him on a regular basis, as has Michigan State. Robert Beck says Lou Alcindor never lost to San Francisco. I didn't realize that, but he did lose to Notre Dame when Notre Dame ended that winning streak, right? What's his name? Mentioned that. Uh, I am old. Detroit Spartan pointed that out. D Mac says. Do you see all the recruits signing next week? And do you see Mel Tucker picking up any more commitments? And what are the chances of stealing Budden from Penn State? The chances don't look good for, from Budden. You know, Michigan State was going to continue to recruit him, and they did continue to recruit him, but Michigan State's not really had the type of year that might have allowed them to steal him, although Penn State did have some problems. I'm not hearing anything. Maybe there's something on the Super Duper download that something could happen, but I'm, I've not detected anything there with Budden. Uh, in terms of the number of the people that are going to sign, 18 commitments right now. I'm guessing, um, I, you know, we've, we've had some articles about it. I'm guessing 12, 13, 14, something like that. We know Rayshon Benny's not planning to sign. Audric Estime not planning to sign. I think Vandemark, the offensive lineman from New Jersey, don't quote me on this, but I think I might have heard that he's not going to sign. Hampton Fay, there's something about it today. You know, Spartan Insight's been doing some uh, research on that. So is Corey Robinson and Justin Thin. They're doing a great job. Paul Conradi doing a great job. Justin Thin doing a great job. Corey Robinson doing a great job. Ricardo Cooney doing a great job. Great starting lineup at SpartanMag.com. Great for the news organization, all the work that those guys are doing. But let's see. You know, Wigginton, Watson, they're going to sign. Derek Harmon's going to sign. Cam Allen's going to sign. So I, I'm guessing 14 or 15. There'll be a few that don't. All right, Brad Fashenko says, care to elaborate on the Rico post regarding a current Detroit player going to the portal? I don't know who that's going to be. You know, I wouldn't be shocked. I don't know if, you know, Mustafa Khalifa, I don't think he's really part of the program right now. Um, would he, would he, is he done with football? Does he want to go to the portal? I don't know. Uh, I'm not, you know, Devontae Dobbs, Kapilovic was asked about him last week and and he kind of was a little bit vague with his answer, didn't want to close the door on the guy, but says if they improve, hopefully they'll be a part of it at some point. Dobbs has had some health issues. I wouldn't be shocked if it's someone like that. You know, there's been some speculation about Julian Barnett. I've not heard anything like that. Now, Barnett, very talented, a guy they want to get on the field. He's been on the field for special teams, played a little bit at corner, but hasn't really grasped the system as much as they want. Is he getting frustrated? I don't know. But, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if um, – 
you know, I'm not surprised that there's somebody that's going to be entering the portal and there's going to be more. So. Mr. Bowman says, Hockey Cop, I've seen one game on TV. What is going on with hockey? You know, they played, um, they are supposed to play Wisconsin tonight, tonight and tomorrow. I feel bad that that was canceled because I would have liked to have watched that, maybe written a little something about it. Uh, they were swept by Minnesota, and they were 1-1 one one against Ohio State. Minnesota's undefeated. Minnesota's pretty good. I think Minnesota's playing Michigan tonight. Might want to turn that one on. I didn't see those games yet. I want to go back on my Big Ten Plus subscription and zip through those games against Minnesota. I watched a little bit of it. I know they came back, played a little bit better in the second game, but not good enough to beat Minnesota right now at home. Um, not good enough to sweep Ohio State after beating them on the first night. Big Ten right now, I think it might not be as there might not be as much parity as there was last year. Last year there was just a mosh pit, one through seven. They're all pretty much equals. Two nothing Minnesota. Thanks, Bone Man. So Minnesota's pretty good. Michigan is stacked with talent, too, as they always are. The defenseman, Cam, what's his name? Number four. He's good. And then the freshman who could be the number one pick in the NHL next year. So so I, I think with Minnesota looking really good, I think that's a third year for their coach, the guy that came in from Mankato. Or did he come in from St. Cloud? He came in from one of those state in-state powers. It was like a, 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 a move that made sense to replace Lucia, who'd been there for a long time. But Minnesota's a program that's got a lot of horsepower, been misfiring a little bit, not hitting their potential. Looks like year two or three with the new guy, they're starting to hit more of their potential. So I think this year in the Big Ten for hockey, you might see more separation. You might see a heavyweight like Minnesota, maybe even Michigan up there, and not as much of complete 17 parity. parity. It might be one or two up at the top. And Michigan State trying to uh, scuffle in there in the middle. So far they've played Minnesota. You know, It would have been nice for them if they had swept Ohio State to get some separation away from the Buckeyes because that's who you're kind of competing with there in the middle. But that's what it looks like right now but I've not seen them in a couple weeks. We'll talk a little bit more about that. I think they play next on the 19th. We'll, I'll try to get a